Hey, everyone, you are listening to the Divergent Conversations podcast. We are two neurodivergent mental health professionals in a neurotypical world. I'm Patrick Cassell. And I'm Dr. Neff. And during these episodes, we do talk about sensitive subjects, mental health, and there are some conversations that can certainly feel a bit overwhelming. So we do just want to use that disclosure and disclaimer before jumping in. And thanks for listening. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Divergent Conversations. Megan and I are excited to kick off a new series where we are going to talk about neurodivergent entrepreneurs, our own journeys. We're going to have some interviews with some really cool people and help share their stories and learn a little bit about their processes, their struggles, um, some of the things that they've experienced along the way. And this is a series that I'm really excited about because I know the clinical side really excites you, Megan. And the business side and the creativity side really excites me. And I love talking about entrepreneurial struggles and challenges, but I also want to highlight from a strengths-based perspective, like all of the cool shit that we can accomplish as neurodivergent entrepreneurs in general. And I don't know about you, but I never really expected myself to call myself a successful entrepreneur in any sense of the word. And especially in grad school, like getting my master's, I just figured community mental health was the end of the road. Same. Like, I don't even think I started using the word entrepreneur to describe myself until the last year. And it was like, oh, that is what I'm doing. I do own a business. I do like, I am an entrepreneur. Um, but same to you. Like as a kid, I definitely had fantasies. I always was fantasizing about starting a business, but executive functioning stuff always um, held me back. And I just kept going to jobs where it's like, you do this, here's the rules. Um, and so this isn't necessarily what I saw for myself. Yeah, I think I felt that way too. Like I needed that regimented, structured, here's the expectation. But then it's interesting, and I don't know about you, but for me, in those environments, especially post-grad school, the walls kind of felt like they started to close in a bit. And I started to really struggle, I think, with my executive functioning more and more, my sensory overload the social uh, struggles that experience in the workplace and then just working like 50 to 60 hour work weeks in crisis environments and being on call and all sorts of hours into the night, interrupting sleep, low pay. I just was cons like constantly thinking something has to sh change here. Like I ended up in the hospital during a vacation because I was so burnt out that my immune system was so depleted. And that was like light bulb moment for me where I was like, yeah, I cannot do this anymore. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I haven't heard that story before. It's a fun one. Um, I went to Tulum, Mexico with my wife back in like 2016. I was managing a community health, mental health, like walk-in crisis center. So I was putting in, probably 70 hours a week on a, a usually average basis. And it was 24 seven. So I could get phone calls at two, three, four in the morning. Hey, this nurse didn't show up. Hey, this thing happened. You need to come deal with it type of situation. And uh, I was just getting sick all the time and worn down, burnt out, depleted, no, no support in general. And we went to Mexico. My immune system was really weak. I, I must have eaten or drank something that was like potentially compromised bacterial wise. I ended up in a small hospital room in Tulum, Mexico. My wife called my dad and told him that she thought he, she was going to be taking me home in an urn because the doctor kind of gave us the information of like, oh, this may not go the way you think it's going to go. And then I was just laying there thinking, I really need to change my life because the stress, the dread, the exhaustion, the constant immune compromisation. I cannot do this anymore to myself. If I get out of here, I'm going to promise myself that I'm going to pursue the things that scare me. Because I think when you have these near-death experiences, life often gets put into perspective. Yeah, yeah. That would be interesting. I, I hear this story a lot, and I'm not sure if it's because it's a good, compelling story. Um, and entrepreneurs often lead with a good, compelling story, or if it's because there's actually something to this. But I hear a lot of entrepreneurs, especially when it is a like, 
I started a business to massively change my life. There is often like a near death experience or some sort of profound moment where our perspective changes and our like what is important to us becomes easier to see. And in that moment, often big changes are made. Yeah, you're exactly right. I think for me, the I started like really deep diving existentially my values. And do I feel good about my career path? Do I feel proud of myself? Do I feel satisfied? And the answer was no. I mean, I enjoyed community mental health to a degree, but it was just not for me. It was never designed for my system. And I've always valued freedom and autonomy and the ability to make my own decisions. And I think placing that above everything else was the apex of that when I started to realize like you could pursue that. It's going to be challenging because you don't know anything about business ownership as so many mental health professionals do not. And, but the risk felt worth the reward to me. And, it, you know, there's also kind of the ADHD part that really liked the excitement and impulsivity, spontaneity of like, let's see what we can create. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I love that. Let's see what we can create. Um, I feel that. I feel that. Hmm. So yeah. you were in academia, but now your career has shifted drastically. And I know we've talked a lot on here because a lot of it was health related from COVID. But mm -hmm. did you ever think to yourself, like while you're in academia or even getting your doctorate, I would be here as an author, podcaster, speaker, course creator, membership host, Instagram personality, all the things. Oh my gosh, absolutely not. I mean, for one, and I think people probably, I mean, maybe they know this about me if they're, they listen to this, but like, I'm a pretty private person. Like I'm personal, like when we're talking and I'm, I share personal information about myself, but I'm pretty private. Like a lot of autistic people, I don't like being perceived. Um, and so if you were like, I'm going to have a big social media account and I'm going to be like doing all these things, I would have been like, what? No, like I want to go to a library. I want to research. I want to read. I want to write things. Um, so this is, yeah, if you had told me this is like five years ago, if you're like, this is what your life will look like, I would have been like, that makes zero sense. <laughs> um, so no, this isn't like something I set out. I often say I'm like an accidental um, Instagram. I don't like terms don't like Instagram work. therapist, but like I'm an accidental Instagram therapist. Like I didn't set out to do that. Um, and then I just kind of built a business. Like people responded to the things I was putting out in the world. And I've just kind of built a business around that in re like in response to people's response. Um, but absolutely, this is not what I expected at all. No, hard same. It's interesting because what you're describing when you say I built something based on responses to responses, that's like market research 101. But for us, you know, you going to your, your um, doctorate, me getting a master's and like so many mental health professionals, just I never sat in a business class. I didn't, I didn't know how to do any of this stuff. I just was creating things that I thought were f engaging. And, you know, we talked about interest-based nervous systems a couple episodes ago, like really following that and recognizing when are, when am I feeling this like creativity flow over me? When am I feeling this ex like this experience and how do I deep dive into it and pursue that at all costs? And I would be like head down creating things all day, not even like thinking about time. By the end of the day, I'm like, oh, damn, I just created a program or a course or a retreat and it was just a, like, it just felt so invigorating in so many ways. But looking back at like 2015, me graduating with my master's, couldn't see the forest for the trees because I didn't know what the possibilities were. And I also didn't ever expect people to be drawn to my personality. Um, like you, not wanting to be perceived. I have a fear that I haven't shared with you. As this podcast grows in popularity, you have to assume that if you're out in public sometime, somebody's going to say like, oh, are you the person who co-hosts this podcast? And that's a big fear of mine at this moment while we're talking about being perceived. Like that in live moments, someone will yeah. perceive you. 
Yeah. yeah. And what about that scares you? Or like, what would that be like to be noticed? Like having the attention on me. You know, we both yeah. talked about how we don't love receiving compliments or positive feedback sometimes. And I, I just would rather float under the radar and go unnoticed, but mm -hmm. continue to create things and continue to figure out ways to make that work for my business. Yeah. 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 No, I, I feel that like there's definitely times where I'm like, have a fantasy of can I take me out of it and just like go become an anonymous person who creates digital resources um yeah yeah the being perceived and then the cry I haven't had that happen yet where it crosses over well I also don't leave my house so that makes it easy um but where it crosses over to my real life but I do think I would feel I would be awkward in that moment. I just know that. And then I would feel awkward about being awkward in that moment. Yep. Um, yeah. Or kick in and mm -hmm. whatever else happens after that. Yeah. Yeah. I was at a bar with a friend in Charlotte a couple of years ago and we had gone to watch a hockey game or a basketball game actually. And I remember seeing someone like staring at me out of my peripheral and I was like, huh, that's weird finally came over and were like, Hey, are you Patrick? I'm in your Facebook group and I listen to your podcast and I was trying to match your tattoos with your pictures. And I was just like, huh, this is uh, really unsettling. I also have no idea how to react to this. So just thinking about that on a bigger scale is, is sometimes horrifying. Yeah. Um, I was just, I was just re reading someone was writing about this. I was just reading something yesterday that I, I thought was such a helpful frame of like, and I, and I think this is helpful for anyone who's, building a business that's kind of tied to you, your personality and your identity. Um, when you do that, you become an object. And what happens to objects is people's stuff gets projected onto us, um, good and bad, and idealization and also opposite of idealization. And that's, um, I mean, that comes with the territory, right? So like, I'm not going to gripe about that. It comes with the territory, but that's, psychologically hard to be an object of people's projections both and i both the good ones and the bad ones like the good ones can feel nice but it can also feel like oh this is a lot of pressure um and yeah. then the bad ones feel really really bad you're so right i think about that a lot in like conference settings or summit settings or retreat settings when people know a lot more about me than I know about them. They almost think that they know you, like that we're colleagues or friends or like we have history together. And I am, you know, as a lot of autistic people struggle with facial recognition, people will come up to me like smiling, making direct eye contact. I will assume they are looking behind me. So I'll always be like this. And they're just looking at me and I'm like, oh shit. And they'll be like, hey, I'm so-and-so. I do whatever, or I talk to you on Instagram or I've talked to you here. And I'm like, okay. Um, hi, it's good to meet you. And then let me try to get out of here as awkwardly and as uncomfortably as humanly possible. Hmm. So it's always, it's just a fascinating look back, but I think like there are so many things that some of my neurodivergence brings to the table and from a strengths-based perspective that can really allow me to be creative and super structured and hyper-focused and create a lot of the projects that I didn't even know existed a year ago, five years ago, three years ago. And I, I know we talk about deficits a lot on here and struggles. So I do want to just also highlight that because I think that has played a major role. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs, if, if they really sat down and checked in with themselves would probably identify as neurodivergent. So I, back when we were, Floating this idea of starting a community for neurodivergent entrepreneurs. I mentioned this. I'm in a community of community creators. I know it's very meta. Um, and I mentioned this as a possibility. And someone was like, well, <laughs> that would include all entrepreneurs <laughs> if you're starting a neurodivergent. And I was like, huh. And I've been hearing that more and more. I wasn't sure if it's because I'm so locked into this little corner of the internet, but I've been hearing that more from people who are in the entrepreneur space of like, yeah, like so many of us are... Specifically ADHD, I hear less about autism, but yeah. um, a lot of ADHD entrepreneurs, which I'm like, that just, you know what, makes sense. That divergent brain, that creativity, that I'm going to work for myself. I'm going to, the hands-on learning 
like I didn't realize how much that would be helpful of like if you're someone who learns by doing and trying things then I think you have like there's a kind of capacity to be like well let me just let me just like try this and let me see if I can learn it on my own and that's a lot of what entrepreneurship is is figuring things out learning on your own learning as you build yeah absolutely I think there is a certain level of like entrepreneurial resilience too because you have to have kind of tough skin sometimes when you're riding this like roller coaster of like I really love working for myself, but I kind of want to close it all down immediately because it's so overwhelming, which is a pretty constant like revolving door. But I think as neurodivergent folks, we've been through a lot. We've probably had to pivot, adapt, evolve, shift in all areas, basically every day, all day. It kind of gives you the ability to do that with your business too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the pivot is huge. Like I know I've, even in the three years that I've been kind of, building neurodivergent insights. Um, I've pivoted a lot and that does, I I think ADHD, it's so interesting because like, I don't think like autism helps with pivoting, but I think ADHD really does help with pivoting of like, oh, new and shiny. Let me pivot from doing this thing to doing this thing. Let me learn about, right? Like new and interesting. Let me learn about this new trend. Um, And so that's where I really do see ADHD being so helpful for entrepreneurship. It's a really good point that you just mentioned. Like, I don't see autism as allowing for the pivot because I think that, you know, being locked in and, and committed to this, the structure and the routine and the consistency is super important. So we've talked about like internal push-pull, autism, ADHD a lot on this podcast as you're both ADHDers. And it is interesting how that informs my business and my decisions. And like we've talked about that before, ADHD, super shiny, sensory, and stimulating and exciting and dopamine rush and autism just being like, can we just stop and pump the brakes and like, please have a couple of days of nothing to do. Yeah. Yeah. I, so I'm, I'll ask you, I'll answer my question that I'll ask you. (laughs) I'll give you a second to think on it. Like I'm, I'd be curious to hear how you feel like you've built a model that kind of like is both structure and allows for new Um, So I'll share mine and give you a minute to think about that. So, and I didn't even realize at the moment, this is what I was doing, but looking back, I'm like, that's why it worked. So the very first thing I did, and this is when I was trying to transition from like, because when I first started Neurodivergent Insights, I was seeing 30, I think up to 30 clients, um, which is for people who don't know, people who do clinical work, 30 is quite a bit, um, just because it's 30 hours and then notes and all, all of the things. And I was spending a lot of time at Neurodivergent Insights. So I was like, I need to figure out. And people kept asking me, like, you have a large account. You're not monetizing. And I was like, at first it was like this weird pressure of like, well, why should I monetize? And then I was like, okay, I'm spending like 30 hours on this. I should figure out how to make some income. So the very first thing I did was a Patreon membership, which I've now closed. But And it was so ridiculous. (laughs) But I was like, join this membership and I'll make, you'll get a workbook a month. Um, which of course the workbooks, like we've talked about, they kept growing and growing to where that became a really ridiculous project. But I'm realizing that having a structure, I'm going to do a workbook a month. That was my structured routine. My autistic self loved that. Um, having it be a membership created the urgency my ADHD needed where it's like, people have paid for this. I need to get this out at the end of every month. Um, but then I got to explore a new topic of interest every month. My ADHD loved that, like the creativity, the new, the shiny, the curiosity, but I had a structure, like doing it in the structure of a workbook um, that I I knew, I knew what to expect. I wasn't trying to learn new technology. And so that combination of like structured, I'm doing the same thing every month. I think I did that for like 18 months. I no longer make a workbook a month, partly that was burning me out. but then paired with, I get to explore a new topic within a structure that worked so well for me, I'm realizing. And now I'm trying to replicate that, like with courses of, okay, I'll, I'll come up with one structure that I do every time, but it'll be a new topic every time. So I'm realizing the more I can build in structure, but new ideas that works really well for me. That's a great point. And I think for so long, <clears throat> because I've, I think I've been 
entrepreneurial most of my life. Like I can think about things where I was always trying to start businesses as a kid and I really enjoyed like the risk reward factor and the impulsivity portion of it. Um, how ADHD dominant my, my business journey has been up until maybe like a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, where I've realized autistic burnout is something I deal with a lot. I tend to push myself into autistic burnout more than I would like to. So I've really had to like step back and zoom out to say, yes, we need to foster the, the necessity, the need for the creativity for the new, for the exciting, for my ADHD parts, absolutely need that. Otherwise, depression and burnout seem to coincide over there. But I also need to build in balance and I need to build in space and I need to build in like darkness on my calendar and in my life. And so even the example of like the retreats that I'm doing this year was chaos. That was like completely ADHD taking the wheel there, doing six events in six months, way too much peopling, way too much traveling, way too much energy. Next year, I've committed to only doing events in odd numbered months and giving myself about a month and a half to two months in between to rest and recharge and have structure and create some vacancy in my calendar without like overreaching, over agreeing, um, trying really hard to mitigate the people pleasing aspect of that that personality too, of like wanting to say yes to more opportunities. So that's one way for sure. Um, and I've tried really hard, like, like you said, when I started all things private practice back in 2020, I was still seeing about 30 clients a week and yeah, like, it's a lot. And I remember during that time, it was like the onset of COVID. We're in our houses. I'm like, I could see 40 clients a week. I'm not oh doing Oh my anything. gosh. No, you can't. <laughs> of course I couldn't. I was like, this is, this is madness. Like I can't do this. And that's when I think all that stillness and being in my house, despite really disliking that most of the time, forced me into this creative process where I was like, I'm really good at like helping other people take their big ideas, piece them apart, put structure to them, um, implement steps and strategies without it feeling overwhelming. That's when everything started to launch and, and I started to really feel creative in that sense. And since that time, trying really hard to balance both. I don't think I do as good of a job of it as you do. Um, you have really good boundaries about your social media, your newsletter responses. Like, I think that I would strive for that to some degree, but it's still definitely a work in progress. And I, you know, major medical and, stuff that we've both experienced mm -hmm. has really- no, I mean, and, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I just say like I came by those boundaries, honestly, in the sense of, and I talked about this early on, I honestly think I'm still recovering. And I, I, I feel kind of weird using this term, um, but I'll, I'll explain it. So there's this term moral injury that I, I really appreciate. It's basically when we're put in situations where like there is injury to our kind of sense of morality, our, our values are um, like, because we're, we're going against kind of what what we morally, like our moral compass. So there's been a lot of research in this in vets. And then during the pandemic, there's so much moral injury happening to doctors. Um, so moral, and moral injury happens to therapists a lot too, or maybe not a lot, but maybe more like vicarious trauma. But I, in my first year and a half of doing this, and again, I wasn't setting out to do a business. I was setting out of like, I see a pattern here. I see how many undiagnosed autistic people there are and I want to right a wrong and I um I might get emotional talking about this my inbox was filled with trauma narratives um and with people saying please help please be my therapist please help me find a therapist you're the only person who I have seen who who's like a psychologist who's talking about this who gets this and this was a couple of years ago there's there's a lot more people in this space now um and I so I was absorbing so much of people's stories and I didn't have pe places to refer people to. I, again, now I have more of like, okay, go check out these places. But right. especially when I was getting started, it was like, I'm sorry, I, I can't take you on um, or I can't help you find a therapist in your state. 
um, and I don't know who to refer you to. So there was so much saturation of that that, it, but and I was so I was holding that, and then I was also holding like back to being an object and people's projected stuff. I was also like getting a couple death threats and getting like terrible things about like you're ableist and you're that. So I'm like both holding trauma and holding people's anger right. about not doing enough. Um, and that was so like, that was so, so hard that those digital boundaries, I was like, I either need to shut this down or create really, really strong boundaries around who, um, who gets access to my mind yeah. and whose stories um, are coming in. And even in my community, like I'm very clear, like we do not share trauma narratives in here. We do not, like this is not a place for crisis. Like if you're in crisis, you don't, you don't share that here. And that's, that's to protect everyone in the community and because trauma narratives should be shared in therapy one-on-one. -on -one. Right. Um, so yeah, I came by those boundaries very honestly, and I'm honestly still recovering from that first year and a half, two years of just being so overwhelmed by the pain um, that that I was that I was like hearing and absorbing. Yeah, thank you for sharing that because that's heavy. And that's heavy for someone to hold, and I'm sure that felt really polarizing at times too. Like, I don't know what to do with all of this. It was hard because like I'd want to help. And sometimes I'd take 45 minutes to be like, here's some people in your state. And but then it like it grew to grumpiness because once if right. it might seem like a small request, but when you have 10 of those a day and they all well, take 45 well. minutes and then there's this helplessness of like, I, I'm hearing your story and I I can't help you. And then the temptation and I would call this projection the temptation is to get grumpy at the person for asking because because of because actually I'm grumpy at myself for not being able to help. But right. then it's like, well, I'm grumpy at you for making me feel helpless, uh, which that's classic projection, right? Of sure. um, so I've had to heal like that grumpiness, um, which again I know is projection, but part of that is healing. That is having like pretty um, grounded boundaries, digital boundaries. Yeah, I love that. I mean, I think a lot of people listening are going to relate to that either desire or that need to have really um, almost ironclad digital boundaries. I get some of that to an extent, not not even close to what you've received, but I would get grumpy when people would DM me and ask me like basic questions about starting a business, basic questions about resources, basic questions about like who I could connect them to. I just find myself getting so frustrated by saying the same thing over and over and over again. Um, and then I'm frustrated at myself for responding to everything. And I'm frustrated at like not having better boundaries. So it's, it's exhausting. And I, I can, I can sense, I could tell like those of you listening, it's, it's, it is a lot. And could, because I think we do want to help so much, but then there's this realization of like, what can I actually do sometimes? Like how much mm -hmm. can I help? How much of myself can I give away? So it's a nice check and balance for sure. Um, I mean, that's where the moral injury part comes in. Like if we didn't care, if we didn't want to help, it'd be like that. It wouldn't be hard, but it's when you're, you're getting an influx of requests and you want to help. These are your people. Yep. Um, and for me at the time this was happening, I also, again, I was doing clinical work. I was in a really hard parenting season. And then I was receiving like, so much stuff in my inbox and my DMs. So it was like, I was everywhere in my life, my parenting, my own identity, my clinical work, and then receiving all these, it was like, it was too much. It was just, it was too much. Well, it's fantastic that you were able to kind of step out of that though, because I think that is what can take a lot of people down a really dark path. Um, when I see a lot of autistic, this is slightly different than entrepreneurs, but a lot of autistic like either content creators or nonprofit people who run nonprofits, like a lot of them are quitting and burning out. Um, and I 1000% understand why. I was going to say, you know, we talked a lot about how ADHD entrepreneurs are creative and outside the box thinkers and all the ideas, autistic entrepreneurs, content creators, et cetera. There's, there's a strong value there where autistic folks are so values driven. 
so authentic that you tend to draw people in based on how you're showing up and talking about some of the things that you're talking about, which has a propensity to also lead to burnout because mm -hmm. you can really attract a lot of energy and attention and focus and response based on just showing up as you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that is like, I, I don't think I came, like, like this term came in my mind, but I think it's a term that's existed in the world, um, identity-based business. Like that's a term I started using around this time where I was thinking about moral injury and all of these things of, and also for therapists, like being an identity-based therapist. And this is true for LGBTQ therapists, black and brown therapists, like you're often drawing your people and things heat up more when it's yep. like, it's values driven, it's identity driven. Um, and then the people you're working with, their trauma is overlapping with your trauma. Um, yeah, that's a whole, like in some, I, sometimes I wish on days where it's hard, I'm like, I just wish I owned a business I didn't care about. I mean, I know I wouldn't be able to, cause I'm not wired that way, but like, right. it'd be so easy if I had this business that I was emotionally detached from, not emotionally detached from, but like, I don't know how to say this. Yeah, where it wasn't so personal. Um, I totally get that. I, I think about that all the time. Um, but like you said, not being wired that way makes it complicated. But I wish I had a business where it was like, yeah, I just do something kind of mindless. I do it on repeat. I don't think much about it. I don't even get to see like the customer facing side or the audience facing side. And you can be behind the scenes. Like I think about that all the time. Yeah. Yeah, my so my dream, I don't know why, but sometimes there's a few like Etsy creators who create mental health digital products um, that are really pretty simple. And my dream, and they like have sold a ton of stuff. I'm like, I just want to be like an Etsy shop owner of really simple, like, here's a CBT worksheet. Here's a sleep worksheet. I don't know if I'd actually be doing CBT worksheets, but um, maybe maybe some of the good stuff from CBT like and a totally just like anonymous i create digital worksheets Th that's my fantasy of like if if the uh if the identity values moral injury stuff gets too hot that's you'll find me in like using a pseudonym on etsy love it we actually have someone coming on in a couple of weeks who has an etsy shop for therapists and does a lot of that stuff so oh well maybe i could pick <laughs> pick that right in because I, I totally get it. Um, I think when you're deeply invested and it's values driven, it feels like a lot more energy goes into what you're creating, how you're showing up. But it also feels, I, at least for me, I don't want to speak for you. It feels like I can sometimes like shame myself if I'd retreat or step away or am not as involved or as invested. And mm -hmm. I think, again, like one of those things where it's like, that's just not how I'm wired to be able to yeah. do that. So or like the feedback, the feedback feels so much more personal. Like, um, I got an email the other day about like, and it's a good suggestion of like adding dates to my blog posts so people can know like how current it is. I'm like, that's a great idea. And I, and, and it's an accessibility thing. And yeah. so I looked into it and I remembered, I have looked into this in the past and like Squarespace for whatever reason makes it so hard to do that. You have to inject code. And after like 30 minutes of this, I was like, okay, I'm not going to be able to figure this out today. Um, and, and I, I mentioned this cause I was feeling pretty burnt out yesterday. I mentioned this to my spouse who used to run a tech department for a school district. And he was like, yeah, we would get, I'd get like 50 emails like that a day of being like, Hey, you should fix this thing. And, and he, he was like, um, his response was always like, yep, that's a good idea. And like, he'd add it to the list, but in his mind, he'd be like, I also know there's so many more important things to address than this. But for me, I don't, again, maybe because I don't have an importance-based system, but every time I get a suggestion like that, especially if it's related to accessibility, I'm like, oh my goodness, I need to be doing this. Yep. And then I'm often working with platforms that don't support it. And it feels like a personal failure. And I'm like, how do I tap into like my spouse's brain of like, right. yes, that's a great idea. There's also 50 other things that need my attention and are perhaps more important. Um, I'm not able to do that. So then every, every recommendation that comes in, it's like, oh, I'm failing. Yeah. Yeah. Everything feels like a 10 out of 10. Um, mm -hmm. Hard to like step back and recategorize or reprioritize when, when you're operating from a values-based 
business uh, mentality. Good for Luke, by the way. I feel like if we asked Jennifer, the person we had on for our Ask a Analytic slash Neurotypical, she would also say she does that. And I'd be like shaking my fist at her. Um, yeah, it's like, that sounds so nice. And it's, yeah. well, it's also like, you know, Luke was running a, te a tech department. It wasn't his. Um, right. Sure. But, but I mean, there well, probably would be some sense of ownership of it, but it's the like taking it personal. That's the part where like, totally. I wish I was able to see neurodivergent insights as a business and less of, less of an extension of me. And I'm working on that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to unwrap yourself from that though, especially when, like you said, when something's been created based on you showing up and you putting yourself out there and you being vulnerable and you sharing parts of yourself, the business then becomes murky and it's hard to step away from. Like people ask me all the time, how come you don't just hire other people to run these events and retreats and summits and whatever? And I'm like, yeah, that'd be great. But like people are not signing up to come see so-and-so. People are not coming up and spending all this money to spend five days with someone they don't know. They think they know me. They want to spend five days with me in whichever destination, which if you know me, I'm not that good of a time. Like five days around me feels like a lot, but I mean, I, I get that. So it's like, how do we, how do we work through that in a way that we can create boundaries for ourselves and support our systems in terms of preventing burnout? So this topic just came up in the um, creator community I'm a part of, and I don't like the term. The term is um, key man risk. I would rephrase it to like key person or key human risk, but the idea in any business, um, how do you reduce key human risk, which is when the business depends so much on, on you as the person. Um, and part of it is like, you know, should something happen to you or should something happen to me? Like, is this a business that can carry on beyond that? That's something I'm, tr I'm definitely trying to think about with my community, particularly because the community is so much more than about about me it's about the connections happening in there but that is a like there's business decisions that go into how do i reduce key human risk in the sense of how much is it that people are coming to this because of the person of patrick or the person of megan anna versus like other experiences they're getting from it so that it for me as i think about like the next five years and con continuing to try to like reduce my risk of just burning out i'm trying to think through how do i make it more about the experience of neurodivergent wellness, connecting with other neurodivergent people and less about me as the person at the center. Also mm -hmm. just with the whole like being perceived that feels a lot more comfortable to me. Um, sure. But there's definitely like a business strategy to that that is not intuitive to me. Um, but yeah, that's something I've been thinking about. It's a good point. I think about that too. Um, maybe in a different capacity. And it's probably important that I put some action to this, but like my group practice, if something was to happen to me, I need, I need to have a professional will in place. Like that just yeah. dawned me. Like that needs to happen. There needs Absolutely. to be. Yeah. We should body like, double it. I have a, I have a template for an entrepreneur will um, that I, that I got and I've, it's been on my to-do list for 15 months to fill it out. Um, we should like body double and do our, our business wills. Let's do it. I I know it sounds more. How do we something. always talk about death? <laughs> I mean, that's just the reality, right? Like we have to, I think so many people shy away from some of that stuff too. And I don't want to deep dive this right now, but yes, let's definitely do that. Because if some, I travel so much, something mm -hmm. happens, you know, God forbid, plane situation, whatever. Like I need to have a plan in place for who takes over, who has access, who does whatever. So yeah, let's let's make that happen behind the scenes. Um, when we started talking about entrepreneurship, I mentioned to you, or you mentioned to me, I cannot remember um, how we do things differently. I want to touch upon that a little bit. Like, I think in one of our episodes, we were talking about how, like, certain marketing strategies. We both mm. kind of made a face, like, "No, I would never do that." Like, yeah, no, not yeah. They tell you to do A, B, and C, and I'm never going to do any of those things. So, yep. What comes to mind yep. when I say that? Oh gosh, so much. I mean, like anything that just feels too salesy or like, I know a big thing in the industry is like, start with someone's pain point and then t tell them the transformation journey. Um, first of all, that makes me so nervous to be like, buy this book or buy this course and you will get X. Like, I yeah. can't guarantee that. 
And I don't know if that's me being literal in my communication, but like that terrifies me. I don't think I'll ever tell someone like you will get this thing if you buy this thing from me, because then I'm like, in my mind, I have contracted with them that like, I will, like you will not be burnt out if you, um, you know, do this burnout course. Um, There's so many social other like factors I don't control. So again, I don't know if that's like me being really literal with my speech, but that's one that I do not care for. Like that's a common business tactic. Um, Urgency is another one that I like, I just don't think that's ADHD friendly. And I like, I think I shared in that last podcast, I did that once and I, it felt gross. Um, I, I just think the way things are talked about, I see a lot of like chat GPT, obviously written sales emails. And I'm like this, first of all, it's so obviously chat GPT. Yep. Secondly, it's so, um, it, yeah. And I, yeah, I don't know. Those are some things that come to my mind. What about you? Yeah, I definitely agree with the the first one that you said um, that grosses me out. So I'm even thinking as you're talking, right? Like I'm doing this neurodivergent burnout retreat. I had to be very poignant with my sales page copy because I don't want to say come to Belize for four days and all of a sudden your neurodivergent <laughs> burnout is going to be gone because that's not the reality. Um, you would be you would be a magician if you could sell people yeah, uh, burnout I'll, in four yeah. days. And I can I'll increase the prices to a hundred thousand a person. And like I'm like I can't say that because I cannot stand behind that. So that's big for me. Is like I can't put something out there that I cannot stand one hundred percent behind because I always think about how it's a representation of me, and that goes for like collaborations, sponsorships, people who just DM probably both of us and are like, Hey, promote my thing for X amount of money because you have an audience. And I'm like, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. So that's stuff I don't do unless I have a relationship and I really value authentic relationships. So I think that's a part of it for sure. Um, yeah, the marketing, like constant barrage of like emails and posts and stuff drives me insane. And it makes me feel gross. Like I hate marketing my stuff. I hate yeah having to post it in groups. Like I hate having to say like, here's an opportunity. I would much rather be like, Hey, this is what I'm doing. If you're interested, Mm -hmm. here you go. Yeah. Like, like like talk about what you're doing. Don't sell to people. And that's what I try to do. And that I told you about this because I, we actually like had a, a a point around this where like I stopped doing summits um, because when you agree to do a summit, you're typically agreeing to like four or five sales emails. I don't do like straight up sales emails. And when I was doing that for the summits, it felt so gross and for so sure. painful. I guess because I did a summit with you, which was a great summit. But I remember you were so kind. You were like, um, would you mind sending one sales email about the summit? And I was like, okay, I, fine. Want, I was never going to ask you to do four. I'm the worst person to ask to be a part of your summit, by the way, if you're listening. Like, I'm not going to promote it. I, I I've, have, I've started I, telling people that when they yeah. ask, I'm like, I'll, if you want me, sure, but I'm not going to promote it or yeah. like, I'll promote it as part of, so I really like the newsletter template I have now. Cause it's, it's blocked. So like I have a block for like upcoming speaking events. And so it's right. like, I put it in there. I feel like people can either read that or not. Same thing with yep. my workbooks, instead of like sending out a sales email, of like check out this new workbook. It's just part of the block on my newsletter of like, Hey, this new product was released. It's on sale this week if you want it. Um, But I want to have like a kind of, what's the word? Um, Casual. There's a more fancy word for it. Um, It's, it's, excuse me, nonchalant. I want to have like a nonchalant, like, yeah, it's here if you want it. Yep. No pressure. I I like that. And I, I, I was just a part of a summit and I knew I shouldn't have done it. And I knew that was exactly what was going to happen. And I'll, they just kept sending like, here are the graphics. Here's the swipe file. Here's the email you haven't promoted yet. You can make X amount of money in affiliate income. I'm like, I clearly don't care. Like I'm not, I don't have any desire. I shouldn't have said yes. But going forward, what I am going to say is, yeah, I'll be a part of it, but I'm not going to do A, B, and C. And if that's okay, great. Because I don't care about making the $33 per sign up for this thing. Like, I just don't want to do that. I have um, yet to have a summit be like, yes, we want you without your promoting. <laughs> like people, people want my, it's gross. Like people want my email yeah. list or my audience. And so if yeah. I'm like, if you want a neurodivergent, like psychologist there, I'll be there, but I'm not promoting it. You're like, yeah. no, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but 
but it's true. I mean, and that's, that's something that feels gross, you know, like people will start coming to you when you develop an audience to get in front of your audience. And again, if I don't have a relationship built or I don't trust your business, or I just don't connect with you as a human, the odds of me saying yes to that are very slim. I'll be very honest. If some of the bigger named mental health companies approached either of us about promoting their products on the show, I would say no. Like there would not be a thought if the one that starts with a B and an H came to us and was like, <laughs> I'll give you $300,000 to tell people. Yeah, to that'd come be a hard no for both like, of us. Sorry, like not going to do it. And I think that is an interesting dynamic as a business owner to be like, I don't want to make that money because I don't like the way it's going to be made. So I, so I want to say this for other like content creators or entrepreneurs. I've definitely learned this through making mistakes and then sitting with it and realizing that didn't feel good. So for example, there was a supplement comp company that reached out to me um, that at first I tried it and I did like their product, but I um, partnered with them and like had their logo on some of my ADHD stuff because they were marketing themselves as an alternative to stimulants. Um, that ended up feeling really gross to me, especially as a psychologist, like marketing a supplement. Um, that that's not my lane. I'm I'm not a prescriber. I shouldn't. I don't think I should be speaking about supplements. But it took me doing that, and that was kind of earlier in my process to realize that didn't sit well with me, and that certainly wasn't worth the money. So I, I just want people to give themselves grace if they've sure. maybe done some partnerships, especially if it's like, yeah, you are pouring in 30 hours and you're like, I need to find some way to make money. Like you've perhaps, people have perhaps partnered with companies that they then realize like, that's actually not a great company to be partnering with. I think we learn a lot of this in the process. Um, so I've definitely made choices that now looking back, I'm like, yep, would not have done that. That's yep. also how I learned how important it is to me to only bring companies I really kind of, um, I, I really believe in, in front of my audience. Yeah, I, I couldn't say it better. And I, I will co-sign that 100%. I think as we're growing and we're, I mean, it's also a privileged position to say I would turn down X amount of money from a company because the values don't align. Um, because some people might get approached for that and absolutely need to take that money because circumstances are very different behind the scenes. Um, but I, I think this goes back to, like you were saying, values-driven business. So if you partner with a company in the past that you just don't agree with anymore, or you felt like it was a bad fit, I think we would both come out publicly and take accountability for that and say like, yeah, I've done this in the past and I wouldn't recommend it again. Or I, I just, you know, I, I've had to do that with like electronic medical record systems that have sponsored me in the last couple of years where I, at the end of the day, I was like, I don't really think that was a great like resource for my community. And I feel like a lot of people just used it to sign up. So I've had to make posts to be like, you know what? I did let this sponsorship affect my marketing and that doesn't feel good for me. So I think ownership, accountability is really important. And transparency, another one of our, our shared values of just being really direct and transparent about how we show up in the world. I think that plays a role in, in all of this as well. Yeah. Yeah. I love that you ha like have circled back and been like, actually, kind of here's, here's my feeling. And you've done a lot more with sponsorships because, because of your other podcast. And so, um, yeah. Yeah. So just know if you message us about sponsorship for this podcast, we'll only consider it if, no, I mean, we're trying to get creative about that too. And that's, I think that's a hard thing because I do think we could create pitches and go after like bigger companies. But then I'm like, is it values aligned? And that is something that I think about a lot. So yeah, values driven businesses. I think neurodivergent businesses feel very values aligned and driven a lot of the time. I think they feel really authentic. I think that you attract and repel based on how you show up and what you put out into the world. And you're not going to be for everybody. Your style is not going to be for everybody. Um, I think that's important to pay attention to too. Uh, I had to get over a lot of that uh, early on. I, I'm having a bit of an aha moment here because I think you and I have had conversations about values and how like partly that's what keeps us engaged and keeps us showing up. And I think as I'm thinking about our conversation today, what we've been hitting on, what I've been hitting on is, um, so so values. Um, Dr. Stephen Hayes talks about this, who's the founder of ACT. I really like how he says it is we hurt where we care. 
So the flip side of our values and like our meaning and the purpose and the drive is that we also, that's where, where we hurt is typically where there's some value that's either misaligned. Um, so I also think when we're talking about things like moral injury and burnout for value-driven business owners, it, it hurts more. Be, be like the, the hard feet, the negative feedback, the constructive feedback, it, it hurts more because we hurt where we care. So for yeah. building a value aligned business, one that drives purpose, meaning passion, but also it means when things do go awry, like it hurts more. Absolutely. Yep. Could not say that better myself. Um, you know, I always find these, I always find these conversations fascinating because you and I had no idea what we were going to talk about today. And I feel like that went on a really interesting, divergent pathway, just all over the place, which feels pretty standard for us. But I, I enjoyed that because I don't want to come on here and just be like, this is how you create a business. This is how you make money. This is how you survive in capitalism. It's more like, how do you create something that really feels connected to your why? And mm -hmm. how does it feel sustainable based on your interests and your energy and your, your capacity? And allow yourselves to pivot and evolve and shift. Cannot tell you how many times I've had a quote unquote good idea that either I pursued immediately, thanks ADHD, or forgot to pursue, probably thanks ADHD. <laughs> Nevertheless, that gives us a lot of good understanding of like what to edit, what to improve, what to change the next time. Because I used to beat the shit out of myself mentally, like, oh, I can never finish anything. Oh, I can never get started. Instead, reframing it to just like, this was actually really good research for me to know what I would do differently next time or would not do differently next time. And that approach has really helped me in my entrepreneurial journey. I'm so glad you said that because that really, I do think like that gross mindset of what can I learn from this? What, what is... What in this is an invitation to learn and grow? That is so, like you have to have that for entrepreneurship. Um, other, otherwise, it, I think every mishap, everything that like gets half done, which we probably have so many projects like that as ADHDers, would just yep. feel so defeating that that growth mindset is so huge of there is an invitation to learn something in this. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Failure feels like a data point for me. Like I mm -hmm. think I would have used to have been way too wrapped up in like perfectionism to let that go. And just the realization that sometimes we try to embark upon projects or collaborations or partnerships or journeys, and it just doesn't go the way you think it's going to. And usually it's for the best. And just to allow it to be what it is, to learn from it, to change your approach the next time, to see it with a fresh set of perspective. Um, that's probably been one of my biggest learning lessons and just strengths along the way through the last couple of years of doing all this stuff. I see failure as a data point that needs to be, you know, for our t-shirt, our non-existent t-shirt collection that that deserves to be, to be on there. One of our many entrepreneurial ideas that is just living in a dock somewhere. I don't know. You know, the thing, the barrier I finally ran into with that, because we, we talked about actually moving forward with merchandise. I was like, I don't want, it took me so long to like figure out a really clean system for customer service for neurodivergent insights. I was like, I don't want more customer service. Like, cause then we'd have to build it for our podcast. That was yeah. the thing that I was like, I don't know if that's worth the, yeah. But totally. yeah, I mean, maybe someday. It's interesting to process that live. And I know we're about to wrap up, but like, we've been talking about monetizing this podcast for the last year and a half. And I think there are so many ways to do it. But I think both of us probably circle back to like, do I have the energy and the capacity to put effort into one more thing? Because mm -hmm. one more thing, and this is what I learned from um, slow, slow productivity, good book, um, especially for content creator entrepreneurs, is that every new thing, what people often don't factor in is the overhead, the overhead of like, the logistics, the coordination of one more thing. And so, yeah, when we were, last time we were talking about merchandise, I was like, oh, the customer service. Yeah. Um, that's, and, and like all of the processes around that. And I was like, that's just, unless we're selling like thousands and thousands of t-shirts, I, I don't think it's worth it. 
And I think that's a really important piece though, with not just collaboration, but just entrepreneurship in general is to get the good idea out there and then step back and analyze it and pick it apart a little bit. Not in a perfectionistic sense of like, it has to be perfect before it can be released, but in a reality sense of, do I have the energy capacity and desire to actually put this together? Because even when we talk about quote unquote passive income, which is something I despise in the entrepreneurial. There's no, yeah, there's no such thing as passive income. Passive income. Yeah. I mean, everything is going to take energy Mm -hmm. to get off the ground and create and keep running. So yeah, I think it's just constant reevaluation and figuring out what makes sense for you in this season of life. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, I make a lot, like most of my income comes through passive income and I work, you know, 50, 70 hour work weeks. Um, and I have a team that works. So it's like, yeah, I think that's an illusion that's out there. And it it is, I mean, it is nice to have income where it's not like direct, you're getting paid X amount of money to be here for this hour. Um, but yeah, I like that you're just, you're debunking that myth of passive income. Yep. Yep. I'm glad you said that. And your, your income is truly never passive because you're going back and like revising things that you've already created and improving and editing all the time. So, I mean, I, I see you doing it with like your posts right now that you're repurposing. And I'm like, mm-hmm. Megan is working on this again. Megan is involved in whatever is going on behind the scenes again. So. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's that autistic, like, I hate having things out there that I like now I'm like, oh, I would say that differently now, or there's new research now, like, it, it, it itches me to know there's things with my name out there that I would do differently now. And I have a lot of things out there. So yeah. like, yeah, the, but I think like, that's going back yeah, through that's accountability, right? Like you mentioned before, when I've circled back on things, that's you circling back on something and saying, oh, like, that's yeah, that's accountability of like, yeah. I value this being portrayed in a way that feels accurate or or supportive or affirming or whatever, I'm going to shift and change and, and I'm going to uh, edit things that I've done in the past. So I think that's an accountability step and measure. Um, yeah, I'm excited for the rest of this series. We have some great guests coming on. Um, a lot of mental health entrepreneurs, but those who are coming on are doing really cool creative things. And then a, uh, ADHD coach as well. So excited for the next couple of episodes, really enjoying doing these collections. After this, we'll be doing an OCD collection, a sensory collection. Uh, so many of you have asked for romantic partnership collection, like, and we do need to do one. So I actually have several names too that people have given me. I, I, I laughed because I'm like, what does it say about us that we're like resistant? I've actually noticed that. I'm like, I feel resistance to doing that series, which... Yep. Um, Totally. Same boat. Same boat. We've talked about That's having our partners on here and have been yeah. like, um, let's, uh, let's hold off on that. Yeah. I, well, some point we can dive into our resistance around that. Um, I'm curious. I'm intrigued. So am I, but lots to come. Stay tuned. And thank you for listening to Divergent Conversations. Episodes are out on Fridays on all major platforms and YouTube. You can like, download, subscribe, and share. And goodbye.